Welcome back. Uh, the finance minister has just announced that the cabinet has cleared a bill uh, ensuring or enabling the creation of a development finance institution as was promised in the budget. Uh, she added that it will have an initial capital of 20,000 crore of which 10,000 crore is going to be provided from this year's budget itself and one assumes the next 10,000 crores uh, comes from the next year's budget and it will be levered up the uh, company will uh, re will uh, leverage that equity to raise about 3 lakh crore it will have an independent board it will have uh, a board which will have 50 percent independent members and they are hoping to attract people of uh, uh, eminence and expertise to the board it will be a powerful board the finance minister said which will even have the power to remove whole time directors uh, the whole time directors themselves are expected to be uh, people who will be given uh, private sector or market driven emoluments so that the best in class can be attracted the best talent in the country can be attracted to the DFI uh, these are the sketchy and small few details that we have about the DFI uh, to talk to us about uh, whether this is a good start and what will be uh, the future role and uh, uh, you know progress of this institution I have with me people who have been there, done that. Joining me now is Mr. R.K. Bansal, Managing Director at Edelweiss ARC. He was formerly, before he retired, Executive Director at uh, one of India's first development financial institutions, the IDBI. I also have with me Sunil Shivastwa, who was uh, DMD and former Head of Stressed Assets at uh, State Bank of India. Again, someone who knows infrastructure, financing very well. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, Mr. Bansal, from the a uh, few details that the finance minister announced do you think this dfi has a good chance to succeed uh, do you think its liabilities have been properly ensured uh, that is the sources of funds yeah basically if we are saying that uh, they can have a leverage of almost 15 times uh, which naturally government has to give some comfort or guarantee like if you remember IDBI, ICIC, IFCI earlier, they were allowed to raise bonds which were guaranteed by government mm. before 1992 and they were eligible for SLR. Mm. So money used to come from banks and PF trusts, etc. Mm. So mm. that was a assured source. Mm. That as a DFI, basically we need two things. One, long-term funds. Mm. And two, maybe uh, we should have some relaxation maybe from a regulator for long gestation period projects. Mm. They, they should not become NP just because there is a delay. So, in so what process. kind of relaxation? I mean, they cannot remove the 90-day NPA norm, right? I'm saying, I'm, I'm not worried about 90 days actually. I'm more worried about the NPA classification based on delay in implementation okay. of the projects. Okay. That creates uh, actually more issues rather than 90 days. All right. So one is the resource availability. Mm -hmm. I think government used to provide a lot of resources to the FIs. Okay. And uh, so that is, uh, as I think it is a positive that government is again saying that they will provide this. I, I'll tell you what they have uh, written uh, here, uh, and I'll get Sunil Shivastu also in. Government will give the DFI certain securities to bring down the cost of funds. So it looks like a guarantee to you, that word, uh, Mr. Bansal? Yeah, certainly it will be in some way uh, comfort from government, whatever way it is okay. Uh, planned. Okay. Uh, uh, Sunil Srivastava, uh, Mr. Bansal, please stay on. Uh, Sunil Srivastava, I am first looking at the sources of funds because uh, for IDBI, ICICI and uh, IFCI, the big problem was the source of funds. As Mr. Bansal said, they had SLR status. Afterwards, the government, uh, the, the, the fiscal tightness came in in the 90s and the SLR status was taken away. But uh, here, I don't think they are talking about SLR at all. Uh, they are saying they will give 20,000 crore initially and that will be levered to make it 3 lakh crore and the DFI will have certain tax concessions for 10 years. Uh, what are your first thoughts in terms of uh, liabilities, uh, Sunil? So, in my first thoughts, you know, we are talking about a span of around 30 years since, uh, you know, 1990s yes. and the markets have moved in the meantime. And given the uh, low interest rate scenario and also the interest of sovereign and pension funds from outside the country, mm to be investing and your invits in the road sector or the transmission sector are, 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 are proof there. Mm. I would say that investor interest would be there if, they, if these are treated as national infrastructure pipeline projects. And they are, if they may not be having an explicit guarantee of the 
uh, you know the country but at least if their national project there be an implied support and uh, things have changed and i think there would be a lot of interest given the their turn scenario and uh, the other factor is that you know as in 1990 you did not have what is called a user pay acceptance today uh, you know nobody travels without a fast tag user pay has come and that could be a security okay. a cash flow security for projects so i think uh, this is a very good move and the first time we've seen a focused and concerted effort at actually focusing on the development of the infrastructure sector and more so See, most of the infrastructure sector no, but sudin one minute one cost. minute i take your your making a separate point that infrastructure today is better run because you have a user pay you have a fast tag so a road will be paid for that is from the infrastructure side builders side but i am first asking you about liability why will you buy the infrastructure companies bonds uh, how will the dfi be able to raise money it will have to raise the money from you and me or from a sovereign fund how do you expect it to raise money so i am i, am, uh, I give you the answer that the interest of the sovereign funds or the pension funds investing in india in the infrastructure sector be it in the transmission the road sector through the invits and the other processes are already a proof that there is a lot of interest and they will come in further now you 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 have to realize also that earlier we had got into cost and time overruns and npa situations where these projects were handled at the you know the line ministries of the departments and any any small problem we used to take ages to solve out mm. at least in these are escalated so that india investment grade or whatever it is called for follow up mechanism the resolution would be faster and there is an implied support in the national infrastructure guideline of the support from the government it may not be explicit now of course there will be tax benefits tax exemption which uh, the fm has talked about mm. we don't know the details let we, the final yeah. things come out but i do not think that we will run into a problem on funding these infrastructure projects okay. i'm sure the first project that will, will be taken uh, online is where where user pay acceptance is is, uh, is a okay. greater certainty than it was fair enough, 30 fair years enough. back uh, one minute uh, uh, sunil and mr bansal if you can stay on i have to take a mandatory break we are coming back and we have more questions for you Good evening. Thanks very much for joining us on CNBC TV 18. I'm Shireen Bhan. Let's go straight to the big story this evening and this comes in from the cabinet. It has decided to give its stamp of approval to the formation of a development financial institution in order to mobilize funds for its infrastructure plans. Making the announcement today, the finance minister Nirmala Sitaraman said the government will be pumping in 20,000 crore rupees into the DFI and 10,000 crore rupees will be infused this year itself moreover the finance minister has also promised certain tax benefits for the infra funding body for 10 years remember this is only a cabinet approval of an already existing announcement that was made by the finance minister in the budget this will now go back to parliament for approval and then the dfi will be operationalized here's the finance minister uh, i had announced it in the budget saying capital infusion from our side would be about 20000 crores and initial grant of 5000 will also be made and this year itself capital infusion is 20000 crores additional uh, increments of uh, the grant will also be made uh, within the 5000 limit that has been given me uh, given to the finance minister and through this we expect to raise considerable amount using this lever from the market Well, that's the finance minister on the cabinet decision today. We have a slew of experts joining us. Before that, let me go across to Lata. Lata, this was a budget announcement today. It has received cabinet approval. It will now go back to Parliament. A little more colour coming in from the finance minister on uh, the DFI, how the board will be constituted, who will be part of the board, and so on and so forth. There's been a lot of discussion that we've already done uh, on the implications of this. Many believe that this is an idea whose time has come, and many argue that it's old wine in new bottle. But uh, be that as it may what do you make of it well the details are still sketchy as you say the positives are that it will be a professional management with market driven emoluments an independent board a board which will have the power to remove its own uh, whole time directors uh, for whatever reason all this will give the board will give the personnel a bit of security from you know cvc and cag uh, i would assume that the powers of the board will be so constituted 
that uh, they will be able to secure the independence and autonomy of the personnel. Uh, at least that was by implication. Uh, but the bigger problem which the erstwhile DFIs, IDBI, ICICI, uh, IFCI uh, faced was the sources of funds, the liabilities. Initially, the funds, the, the, uh, the bonds that they floated were treated as SLR. So banks had to put you know, 20, 20%, 25% of their deposits in those bonds. Later on, when the government was itself issuing, you know, raising a lot of deficit, they removed the SLR status for the DFIs. After that, they were given tax-free status. Then when the government ran out of money, even that tax-free status was removed and they were asked to raise money from the market. And when you raise money from the market and then financed uh, infrastructure institution, it was too expensive, that money. Now, we have to see whether the current arrangement of 20,000 crore given by the government and it getting levered up 15 times by the DFI works. If you want to leverage it and if you want you and me to buy those bonds or a sovereign wealth fund to buy those bonds, mm. they must be government guaranteed. So if it is guaranteed by the government, there mm. is a contingent liability over there. Uh, all these will have to be taken into consideration. We have to see how it will uh, succeed. All, now that is the liability side. On the asset side, we have to ensure that the infrastructure project succeed. As uh, Sunil Srivastava was just telling us, yeah. now we have learned how to work infrastructure. You know, the fast tag ensures that roads are paid for by those who use. So maybe fewer infrastructure mm. projects will fail and therefore this DFI can succeed. Uh, we will have to wait and see. We have the same old problems of mm. running infrastructure uh, properly and the same old problem yeah. of a DFI raising money. But uh, it's quite possible that we have become wiser second time round. Absolutely. Perhaps have learned the lessons from the past. But Atta, hang in there. Uh, let's bring in our guest. Joining us now is Vinay Chatterjee, Chairman of CII's National Committee on Infrastructure, also part of the committee uh, that uh, gave its recommendations to the government on the DFI. Uh, with us, Sunil Srivastava, the former Deputy MD of State Bank of India, and R.K. Bansal, Edelweiss ARC. Gentlemen, thanks very much for staying on. Uh, Vinay, let me come to you first. Uh, and I know you were most excited last year, hoping that this would be a budget announcement in the last budget. It didn't come through. It's come through this time around and uh, it's got the cabinet approval and now it's pending parliamentary approval. Uh, when I, to the point that Lata was making on some of the lessons perhaps that have been learnt uh, from the legacy issues of the past and how the DFI will now be structured in order for us not to be able to repeat those. Uh, what do you believe the road ahead looks like? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Shireen. As you can see that it is a happy moment for all of us. Uh, that you are uh, one of those people who are fully aware that the advocacy has taken about four years, but it has resulted in the government listening to the message, buying it and implementing it. So I am actually very happy that the NDA government has, in a sense, uh, you know, taken it uh, to its logical conclusion in starting this DFI. I want to make three broad points before we go to dissecting the trees in the forest. Let us take a helicopter view of the forest first. And I want to make three broad points. And mm. The nation building approach requires developmental finance. I mean, large projects that were done in the 60s, late 50s, like the Bhakra Nangal, Namodar Valley Corporation, etc. were nation building public mm. works projects that gave economic returns to the country and not just standard vanilla flavored financial returns, which private financial markets are used to. India today requires mm -hmm. an institution that provides developmental finance for infrastructure in the same way that the Japanese gave us, you know, about a little short of one lakh crores for the bullet train, 60 year money with a 15 year moratorium at 0.6% mm -hmm. interest. That is called developmental finance and a nation mm -hmm. building approach and public works programs mm -hmm require that approach. So the DFI is going to fulfill a big need, which the earlier DFIs fulfilled in the 60s and 70s. And after independence, India was short of industrial capital. And in the three decades, 60s, 70s and 80s, mm. IFCI, ICICI, IDBI provided industrial capital, which allowed India to develop into an industrial mm. powerhouse. So they had their role, they had their time. And at this point of time, the real need is the crying need for infrastructure capital with a developmental objective. If infrastructure, some projects in infrastructure mm -hmm. are amenable to private sector returns at the point that has been made earlier, God bless them and let private markets fund those projects. But there are large swaths of expenditure 
large public works programs, whether it is health or water or transportation or irrigation, that requires a developmental approach. And my last point is that there are many countries, Prime Minister Modi's international outreach, most people will agree, has been, been one mm. of the finest successes in foreign policy. There are many countries in the world who are willing to give long-term developmental capital to India, provided there is a vehicle, a receptacle that can mm. absorb those long-term developmental capital. One mm. project was, of course, the bullet train. Before that was Delhi Metro. But they were individual projects. This time, the government has created a large vessel right. called a DFI, which can attract long-term developmental capital from friendly countries, people who are, who are willing to put developmental capital in mm. India's infrastructure, and we now have that vehicle. So I'm stopping making these three broad points, seeing the helicopter view of conceptually why a DFI was needed. And I'm once again reiterating my happiness that it has come into existence. Over to you. Your, smi your smile says it all, Vinayak. I know that you've been uh, waiting uh, uh, with bated breath for this to actually be approved and it has now gone through. But Sunil Srivastava to take Vinayak Chatterjee's points and he's laid out the context of why we need a DFI at this point in time. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, the, the helicopter view that he's... Uh, He's uh, articulated there uh, to the point that he's making about pension funds, sovereign funds. And that's what we heard from the finance minister as well there, uh, that they will have the risk appetite to join hands with the DFI to put money into the DFI. Uh, Sunil, do you believe that that, uh, given the context, is a much more likely possibility today? So, Sunil, let me ride the helicopter with Vinayak. And I would say that, you know, uh, there is, <laughs> while we await the details, but I assume that this is the first time there has been a serious attempt to at least appreciate the risk and mitigate and reduce the same to a national monitoring project pipeline. At the same time, uh, increasing the stability and certainty of returns and making them more attractive through the tax benefits that we the FN spoke about. And with all this, I think the marketability for getting the liability side catered to becomes that much easier. So I, I'm, I'm as excited as Vinayak is, and we're all excited that this is the first time there's a very concerted attempt to actually focus on the development of the economic infrastructure. Social mm -hmm. infrastructure will have to be heavy lifted to other means okay. well, but definitely this requires a developmental institute, you know, framework. Okay. And that has been provided through this, uh, uh, you know, the new bank, that uh, the development bank that we are talking about, the FI. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Vinayak, I wanted to know how will this be different from the existing development finance institutions that we have. For roads, we have NHAI and NHAI bonds. For power, we have PFC and PFC can also float bonds. For uh, uh, railways, we have IRFC and they also. If you want to give tax-free status to any of these bonds, we could have given. How is this going to be different and why will this succeed uh, where NHAI won't? Because for the simple reason, Lata, is that all these institutions borrow from the market mm. at market rates of interest yep. and they're onward led. Here we are looking at an institution that's not going to be borrowing from commercial markets, but will be borrowing from very large international developmental institutions like JICA in Japan. Mm. Has PFC and REC given 0.6% loans for 60 years to the power sector with 15 year moratorium? That answers your question. Mm. There are worldwide institutions that are willing to fund India long term with cheaper rates, with longer tenures for developmental purposes. So the, the debate is completely different. It can't be compared with uh, IR, uh, IRCTC or PFC raising money from the market and then onward lending it to their sector. Okay. That's an existing financing model of NBFCs. Okay. This is vastly different. It is a new vehicle that's going to tap international developmental funds, okay. which come at far, far lower rates and expectations, like the bullet train example I gave you, okay. saying Japanese did give 1 lakh crores for 60 years at 0.6% interest with a 15-year moratorium. Okay. Can any PFC, REC borrowing from the market match that? Which means there are availability of such funds available. So and 1 lakh crore came for the bullet train. If 1 lakh crore can come for the bullet train, surely 5 lakh crores can come for a nationwide DFI. So you don't have to give tax concessions in that case? You may have to. Let us. I mean, you require a bundle of supportive stuff to see that the funds do remain low cost. And th that is where in the days ahead, when we see the fine print, we will see the other basket of incentives and sweeteners that will make the DFI attractive, not just for people who are investing. Now, there'll be two classes of investors. 
please remember that the government has said that in the medium term it is willing to dilute down to 26% and invite developmental funds to take equity positions also so you are looking at equity on offer after that you are looking at deveraging debt on offer so the the sweeteners for equity the sweeteners for debt all of them in the days ahead we will look at the bill we will look at the fine print but the broad effort is to create a corpus of developmental capital not commercial finance capital and i think all everybody all of us in media need to appreciate mm. that point otherwise we didn't require a dfi right uh, mr bansal just to take that point forward as uh, vinayak was pointing out and this is something that we heard from the finance minister as well of course we will await the fine print but the finance minister did speak of uh, certain tax benefits for a 10 year a uh, tenure uh, as i pointed out we will need to see what are the other sweeteners as part of this but what is it that you would like clarity on uh, what do you believe uh, is different this time around what do you believe will ensure success this time around so sirin if i look at uh, the points which are being made basically i think we still need more clarity but uh, we also need to see why mm. the dfi didn't succeed whether it is idba ifci icic or including uh, idfc later and then ifcl so what vinayak is saying is altogether a different entity i think that is typically to fund the government infrastructure initiatives and that should have a very long term funding requirement i mean you can't compare with jb can jb uh, because they japan has a very low cost structure and they can provide 100 100 year uh, loans also see we have been uh, muddled in our thinking when we talk of uh, i mean market economy and then we talk of government so if government wants to have an institution to fund the government project which are the risk is borne by the government i think there is no issue uh, then this dfi can also succeed but i was i was telling lata the problem is basically resources alm and your np classification now if these D same dfi as we nag rightly said if you to borrow from the market and then compete in lending to infra and follow all the npa norms there will be issues so if we are clear that as a country hmm. we want to develop a dfi for lending to national projects where the risk is also taken by government then in any case the issues of npas are also taken care the one issue which uh, i think we need perhaps some relaxation from rbi would be because there will be long gestation projects as of today if the project get delayed by one year right. it becomes np so that also needs uh, i think some relaxation i would still feel it should be more of a mm -hmm. credit and enhancement structure whereby the government raises money from other pfs and other pension fund where government gives some sort of a comfort and guarantee instead of otherwise the dr seems to be from right. your own uh, uh, explanation it is 15 uh, to 1 i mean then if it is a market linked uh, structure mm -hmm. then 15 to 1 dr can never work right well we will have to gentlemen await the fine print but thanks very much for joining us here with your initial reactions uh, to uh, the decision that has now got the cabinet's approval vinay chatterji sunil shrivastava mr bansal we will bring you back uh, when we see the bill being uh, taken to parliament which is expected within this budget session as well so perhaps before the 25th is when we will have more details time now for us to enter a short break but coming up